Section 31 of Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Woman in the Nineteenth Century and Kindred Papers Relating to the Sphere, Condition, and Duties of Women by Margaret Fuller. Section 31. Educate Men and Women as Souls Had Christendom been true to its standard, while accommodating its modes of operation to the calls of successive times, woman would now have not only equal power with man, for of that omnipotent nature will never suffer her to be defrauded, but a chartered power too fully recognized to be abused. Indeed, all that is wanting is that man should prove his own freedom by making her free. Let him abandon conventional restriction as a vestige of that oriental barbarity which confined women to a seraglio. Let him trust her entirely, and give her every privilege already acquired for himself. Elective franchise, tenure of property, liberty to speak in public assemblies, etc., Nature has pointed out her ordinary sphere by the circumstances of her physical existence. She cannot wander far. If here and there the gods send their missives through women as through men, let them speak without remonstrance. In no age have men been able wholly to hinder them. A Deborah must always be a spiritual mother in Israel. A Corinna may be excluded from the Olympic Games. Yet all men will hear her song and a pinder sit at her feet. It is man's fault that there ever were a Spatia and Ninans. These exquisite forms were intended for the shrines of virtue. Neither need men fear to lose their domestic deities. Woman is born for love, and it is impossible to turn her from seeking it. Men should deserve her love as an inheritance rather than seize and guard it like a prey. Were they noble, they would strive rather not to be loved too much, and to turn her from idolatry to the true, the only love. Then, children of one father, they could not err nor misconceive one another. Society is now so complex that it is no longer possible to educate woman merely as woman. The tasks which come to her hand are so various, and so large a proportion of women are thrown entirely upon their own resources. I admit that this is not their state of perfect development, but it seems as if heaven, having so long issued its edict in poetry and religion, without securing intelligent obedience, now commanded the world in prose to take a high and rational view. The lesson reads to me thus. Sex, like rank, wealth, beauty, or talent, is but an accident of birth. As you would not educate a soul to be an aristocrat, so do not to be a woman. A general regard to her usual sphere is dictated in the economy of nature. You need never enforce these provisions rigorously. Achilles had long plied the distaff as a princess, yet at first sight of a sword he seized it, so with woman, one hour of love would teach her more of her proper relations than all your formulas and conventions. Express your views, men, of what you seek in women. Thus best do you give them laws. Learn, women, what you should demand of men. Thus only can they become themselves. Turn both from the contemplation of what is merely phenomenal in your existence to your permanent life as souls. Man, do not prescribe how the divine shall display itself in woman. Woman, do not expect to see all of God in man. Fellow pilgrims and helpmeets are ye, Apollo and Diana, twins of one heavenly birth, both beneficent and both armed. Man, fear not to yield to woman's hand, both the quiver and the lyre, for if her urn be filled with light, she will use both to the glory of God. There is but one doctrine for ye both, and that is the doctrine of the soul. End of section 31. Educate men and women as souls. Recording by Pamela Krantz.
Kierkegaard asks. Can prosperity serve for strengthening the inner being? Can fortune or misfortune serve for strengthening the inner being? Can adversity serve for strengthening the inner being? Each single individual must decide this for himself and that depends on how one sees. If he understood himself or tried to understand himself, if he truly was concerned about understanding himself, if the inner being announced itself within him in that concern, then he will understand prosperity, then he will understand the significance of its being denied him, then he will not occupy himself with flights of fancy and fortify himself with dreams but in his adversity will be concerned about himself. Consider him the person who was wronged. He complains not about life but about people who corrupt everything and embitter what God made good. Then everything became confused for him. There was no God who intended everything for good, but everything was left up to human beings who intended everything for evil. But the more his soul stared down into the abyss of dark passions that arose in him, the greater was the power that the anxiety of temptation gained over him until he himself plunged down into it and lost himself in despair. For even though the pain did not sweep him off his feet in this way, he stood case hardened among his fellow human beings. He saw the same thing that had happened to him repeat itself in others, but he felt no sympathy. Indeed, what good would it have done anyway, since he had no comfort to offer? or he hid from people in order in solitude of soul to immerse himself in his bleak wisdom, to fathom the thought of despair. 18 Upbuilding Discourses Hong 1990 pages 95-96